Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dave Ripplinger. I'm an economics uh, specialist with NDCU Extension. Uh, be moderating uh, this and the, the future webinars that we're hosting uh, again in 2022. Uh, just to kind of kick things off, to remind everybody, we'll be doing questions and uh, discussion uh, at the end. Uh, so please use the chat or Q&A features. Do you have any questions uh, during the presentations? Uh, please list them there and we'll get to them when we're when we're done. Uh, we're actually going to end uh, this month's uh, webinar with a little bit of a discussion on things that we're looking for in 2022, hopefully uh, spurring some questions and, and some interaction uh, with, with you who are joining us today. Uh, with that, I'd like to uh, turn the floor over to Brian Parman, who's going to be talking about fertilizer prices and inflation. Thanks, Dave. Uh, kicking off 2022 uh, with our webinar series again, and uh, we're glad to have everyone who's uh, who's who keeps logging in and 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 viewing these because you know if if you didn't we we, we wouldn't keep doing them. So we're glad that you're here and willing to spend an hour hour and a half to, uh, uh, talking to us. So my presentation today is on a, you know, it's pretty self-explanatory, uh, fertilizer prices and inflation. Those are one of the things dominating national news uh, as far as the economy goes. And the other one really on the forefront of everyone's mind in, in terms of agriculture as we start focusing our attention on spring planning and what, what fertilizer prices are going to look like. So my first slide of the presentation outside of the title slide uh, I just grabbed some headlines um, from from the national news, uh, different places, uh, and what they basically said and discussing as far as uh, inflation goes. And uh, part of it, one of the headlines was that we, we closed out December, so all of 2021, with inflation at 7%, which was the highest rate in 40 years. And I have a chart that kind of shows that. A lot of folks are hearkening back to the 1980s. Uh, at the, that being basically the last time that inflation hit 7% and it was, it was actually higher during that time, that time period on, in some of those years, but, uh, uh, definitely the highest that it's been since then. Um, as a result, the federal reserve has said that they're going to accelerate their increase in interest rates to help combat some of the inflation that that's seemingly been accelerating last fall. Um, three rate hikes in the cards they're they're talking about for 2022. And as of the last several years, the, these rate hikes have been a quarter of a percent each. They don't have to be that small. Um, there are many instances back in the 80s when, when inflation was a, hum, a really large problem where they, they hiked rates uh, quite a bit more than that, several percentage points in, in, in one shot. And then... Uh, as a result, economists around the country have boosted their inflation forecast for 2022. Most were saying around that two and a half, three percent range. Now nah, they're thinking it might be a little bit higher. And then uh, a headline this morning was that wholesale prices or the producer price index, which is what it's also called, jumped nearly 10 percent in 2021, which was the highest on record. But to be fair, the, the record started for this in 2010. So not nearly as, as long of a history as, as some of these other inflation metrics, but still the highest nonetheless, and uh, showing uh, signs of this growing inflation. Now, some folks have also said that because the December inflation number was a little bit lower than November, that maybe it's decelerating, but I would kind of issue a word of caution on that because a one month observation, and I'll show it here in a sec, uh, uh, some of the monthly numbers probably isn't enough to really to really say with something in, as, as, as far as inflation goes that it's that it's slowing down. So my next chart just kind of shows uh, three main categories, three large categories in terms of folks' budget. All items were at seven percent inflation. Food inflation was a little bit lower than that. That one's been dominating headlines as well, the increase in food prices. The big one being energy, of course. Energy costs have been extremely high approaching 30 percent for the year uh, and when you look at core inflation which is all items less food and energy that was closer to five and a half percent but when you add food and energy in mainly energy that inflation number is uh, right around seven percent for the year now on a historic historical timeline which uh, my next chart shows uh, we can see where this a seven percent inflation rate actually would be and i put that in there they don't have this out yet so that seven percent isn't 
um, quite official. They kind of wait for a lot of the dust to settle before they put the official number out in historical perspective. But that line there across shows where 7% inflation would be going back to about 1960. And again, you got to go to the very early 1980s to see inflation numbers higher than that. And they were higher than that. You look at there at 1980, uh, inflation 13, 13.5% being, being the highest uh, as far as this data is concerned. And then in the early to mid 70s, uh, north of 10% as well. But still 7% nonetheless, definitely the highest we've seen since that about 1981 mark. So you can see clearly why folks are pretty concerned about it. And then this next table just shows the monthly inflation numbers as a percentage. And the ones I've highlighted in yellow are the highest since 2011 for that month, or at least as high, if not higher. So equal to or greater than. And then in the right, it's that total 7%. So you can see there were some lower numbers. Okay, like for instance, August of 2021 was 3%, in 2020 it was 4 uh, in 2017, it was four percent, so it was lower. So when folks are saying that you know it's decelerating, maybe because it was less than November, uh, there were other months that were lower as well. I don't think one or two months observations is probably enough to make a definitive statement on uh, the direction inflation is going. So it's diff definitely something that folks are being mindful of. It, the Federal Reserve is is getting ready to take action on it. Uh, everyone's aware of the fact that inflation has been. Uh, creeping up and has hit uh, one of the highest marks that we certainly that we've seen in a, in a very long time, uh, the highest in my lifetime actually. Uh, I wasn't around in nineteen eighty uh, early early nineteen eighties. So, but nonetheless, uh, it remains to be seen if the actions taking will will curb it. And another thing to keep in mind: any action that the Federal Reserve takes is probably going to be slow to react. Um, they've, you know, when I was going to school often inflation, uh, curbing inflation and monetary policy was compared more to steering a ship than uh, steering a sports car, where you got to start turning the wheel long before the turn is coming up because it takes a long time to get a big old ship to turn 90 degrees. Well, inflation, managing inflation and monetary policy is a lot the same way. It'll be several quarters before we see the Federal Reserve's actions actually having an impact and then trying to determine how how great that impact was it's it's not an easy thing to do so the next part of this i just wanted to hit on fertilizer prices and what is kind of going on there this one this particular ch chart just shows fertilizer cost per pound of n okay so anhydrous is is fairly expensive it's the most expensive fertilizer product per ton but per pound of n because it has the most nitrogen in it it's actually the least expensive but since February of 21, roughly January of 21, anhydrous has gone from about 28 cents, 27 cents retail to close to 90 cents, 80, 88 cents uh, per pound. Um, and uh, so, you know, more than doubling to two and a half times what that price was. And all the other fertilizer products, the common nitrogen products, urea, anhydrous uh, and UAN 28 and 32 have all kind of followed suit. So my next chart looks specifically at uh, potash, actually, in this case, and potash prices have more than doubled since uh, since last winter. Uh, if you look at this chart, the red line is 2021. That gray dotted line near the bottom is the five year average and potash has gone from about 375, maybe $380 a ton in January, all the way up to 810. So more than double. Um, and that that's one fertilizer component that has obviously seen it and, and they all have to a degree but potash has increased pretty remarkably. My next two charts, they show uh, phosphorus prices for uh, MAP and DAP, two commonly applied phosphorus uh, uh, fertilizers, increased as well. Again, that gray dotted line at the, at the bottom, and these charts are courtesy of uh, DTN. Um, that's that five-year average, and you can see that MAP went from about $550 a ton, closing out 2021 at over $900 a ton. And DAP starting the year around $480 a ton and closing out closer to $880 a ton. So phosphorus price is up pretty dramatically as well. And then my next chart, uh, the last chart of this presentation, uh, shows urea prices, something that's uh, frequently applied in, in, in North Dakota. And right around $375 or so dollars a ton to start the year, right at that five-year average, 
and closing out the year closer to $920 a ton. So more than double on the, on the urea prices as well. So pretty much across the board, large fertilizer increases, especially beginning back uh, in October, that September, October timeframe is when we've really seen fertilizer prices take off. And while the slope may, of these, maybe the increase in prices have decelerated a little bit, it's still increasing and it's still been week over week, we're seeing prices rise uh, over and over again. And so one other thing to mention on fertilizer prices as well is there is a study done out of uh, Texas A&M and some concerns about tariffs on nitrogen fertilizer coming, coming down the pike. Uh, petitioned by CF Industries with the International Trade Commission to impose tariffs on fertilizer from uh, those countries, Trinidad and Tobago, as well as uh, Russia. And the International Trade Commission ruled over the summer that imports of UAN were harming uh, domestic producers because they were being sold uh, relatively cheaply uh, or less expensive than, than and harming uh, domestic producers. The U.S. Department of Commerce, uh, their preliminary evaluation of these tariffs uh, from this petition uh, recommends that the tariffs actually be implemented. And uh, the study from Texas A&M that, that just came out not that long ago uh, basically stated that on average it would add about $102 per ton to current fertilizer prices. So that would be on top of what prices already are right now because the tariff hasn't been, uh, to my knowledge, implemented yet. So there's this study was funded by the uh, national corn growers and uh, as a concern for what these tariffs might do to uh, uh, nitrogen prices and the study uh, conducted by a and said yeah it will increase them 102 dollars per ton on average so definitely going to have an impact which tariffs often do that when you put a tariff on a on an import um, the, the the likely result of that is going to be higher domestic prices on the country that imposes the tariff some are worried about even potentially some shortages or something like that. That's been some of the concern. I didn't read anything that there would be an, an, an additional amount of any kind of shortage, though that's obviously possible, but it, it is likely going to add uh, an additional cost to a, to a product that's already fairly costly. So not, not any good news right now on the uh, fertilizer cost front um, coming out uh, to start the year. So I know folks are going to be having a lot of uh, decisions to make as far as planting, what crops do you plant, how much are you going to apply. Uh, again, this is a great time to encourage soil testing this year because it's probably a year that, uh, that, it's, that, it, that it will in fact pay off not applying any more than we absolutely have to. So with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to our next speaker, who I believe is Dr. Olson, if we keep the same order we've been going with. And uh, thank you very much. And I'll be around at the end for questions. All right. <clears throat> thank you, Brian. Uh, so again, I'm Frane Olson. I'm the crop economist and marketing specialist with NDSU Extension. Here's my contact information. So again, if you think of something uh, later on after this session and you want to get a hold of me, this is how you, you'd contact me. So my first slide, I just wanted to remind everybody that um, yesterday, the USDA actually repeat, replay, reported three key update, four key updates, get my math right. Uh, the first is the January update for the World Agricultural Supply Demand Estimates or the WASD. That's a monthly update um, and, and again provides both the supply side as well as the demand side for US as well as international grains. They also released the uh, 2021 crop production summary. So this is the final official numbers for corn and soybean production and uh, production, both uh, yields, uh, acreages harvested and total production. It also has lists it for a lot of other crops, but the market was primarily watching corn and soybeans. Um, and of course, those numbers then feed into that January WASDE. We also had a quarterly grain stocks report. So every three, every four, every three months, four times a year, USDA does a major survey of not only uh, farmers, but also industry on how much grain do you have in reserve at a particular point in time. So the grain stocks report we got out yesterday was actually for December 1. So it's as of December 1. And then the final one was the winter wheat and canola seedings. So now canola seedings, it's winter canola. I wanna be very specific about that. So it's winter wheat and winter canola seedings. So on the next slide, I just want to provide an overview of the 
the corn and soybean production numbers. So again, these are the final estimates uh, or final numbers that we will get for uh, total production yields and area harvested for corn and beans, along with a lot of other, other uh, crops. On the very bottom highlighted in red are the numbers that got reported yesterday. Uh, the, the black line, black road just above that is the information that we had as of November. So November was the last time that USDA revised or updated their forecast for yield and acreage and total production. So when we look at the November numbers versus the January numbers, which are final, you can start to see some small shifts and adjustments. The top row highlighted in blue is what the trade was expecting. And so you got to be a little bit careful saying, well, was the number up or down from where we expected or was the number up or down from last year's uh, or last um, the last estimate? In both cases, the corn production number was slightly above what the trade was expecting and what we saw in November. Again, these are very, very small refinements, but it, when we get to the bottom line on how many bushels do we have available, it will, um, it, it can make a difference. There was no adjustments in the yield. There was the, the increase in production really came from a slight increase in harvested area. There wasn't quite as much abandonment as we had first expected, as well as there's a possibility some of the corn silage uh, that was initially intended to be um, Chop corn silage now got switched into actually being harvested for corn. On the soybean side, again, very, very similar. The numbers, what the trade is expecting, the numbers we saw uh, in November, very similar to what we what we got um, in the soybean. The, the slight revision was an upward revision in the yield per acre. We're going from about 51.2 to 51.4 bushels per acre. Uh, and harvested acreage was, again, well within the range of what we were expecting. So no major big shock value here, but a few small tweaks and a few small adjustments. The next slide shows the ending stocks number. So this is, you take the total supply, subtract out all the pr proposed usage or forecasted usage. How much do we think we're going to have in reserve just before harvest of next year? Once again, the bottom row is in red is the numbers we got yesterday. The, the row above that highlighted in black is the information from the December report. So that was the last time we had estimates. And then, of course, the blue line on top is what the trade was expecting to see. Again, not big shifts, not big changes, but some refinements. Ending stocks on all wheat increased slightly, mainly because there was a reduction in the forecast for exports. On the corn side, the increase in corn ending stocks is primarily because of the increase in harvested area. Okay, there were some small adjustments. We had a small increase in ethanol. We had a small reduction in exports on the demand side, but those were basically washed. So again, small refinements, small tweaks and adjustments. For soybeans, again, very small adjustments, very small tracking differences. The, the reason the bottom line uh, for ending stocks increased is primarily because we had a slightly higher yield than we had first expected. The next slide is a summary of the grain stocks report. Now, this, this is one of those reports that often kind of flies underneath the radar screen, uh, but it is really important for corn. And, and the reason this is followed so much for corn is because it's very difficult to try and track the amount of corn going into the feed and what we call feed and residual, basically going into the livestock sector, because a lot of that corn does not go across a scale anywhere. Um, so it's, it's, it's grown on the farm, goes from the combine into a bin, from the bin into an animal. And so these quarterly stocks report is one of the ways that we try and track feed usage. And we, again, there's some adjustments for seasonality and the fact that, especially during the winter months, feed, feeding tends to be a little heavier. So again, no major surprises, small adjustments. When we look at the, the top row, which is the blue one, what the trade is expecting to see versus the bottom row in red, very similar numbers. We tightened up uh, a the trade was expecting a little bit higher numbers for wheat. Uh, obviously, the corn one is well within rounding error, and then the soybean one also well within rounding error. The next slide is winter wheat seedings. So again, same process. The row on the bottom in red is the actual numbers we got. The row above it in black is from last year's information or basically the final plantings that we had from, from 2021. And then the blue on top is what the trade is expecting. Uh, 
again, not not anything major, I guess, other than again some refinements. The if you look at the numbers, the trade was expecting um, when, when we look at by class. So we got hard red winter wheat. The hard red wind week numbers came in a little bit lower than what the trade was expecting, but a little bit higher than we had last year. So we were looking for an increase. The increase wasn't quite as much. For soft red winter wheat, the expectation was we're going to see a slight reduction. And we actually got a slight increase. And thus, the reason that the Chicago wheat futures dropped significantly last year, yesterday is because we, it looks as though we're going to have a bit more soft red winter wheat plantings than we had first expected. And then the white winter wheat, which is primarily in the Pacific Northwest, again, came in very, very close to what the trade was expecting. So once again, some small refinements. Then the next slide is really what, what sets us up for what the market's talking about today. And that is, what is the size of the South American crop? So once again, these are USDA estimates, they're USDA forecasts. There's a lot of private companies that will forecast their own uh, production numbers. And, and again, understand that when a private company comes out with these numbers, we can get some pretty large swings from one reporting period to the next. The red line on the bottom, the red row, excuse me, on the bottom is what USDA came out with. The black line highlighted just above that is for last month's estimates. And then, of course, the blue is on top with what the trade was expecting. So let's, I, there's a couple of things I really want to highlight. And it, it, it's a combination of both corn and soybeans. So we have both Argentina and Brazil. Um, the corn number, so let's look, Argentine corn came in very, very close. USDA really didn't revise that very much. A lot of the private forecasters have revised that down a lot more heavily. And I'll show you some maps in just a moment to try and explain that. For the soybeans, there's actually a recognition that, yep, Argentine soybeans are in trouble. And so surprisingly, USDA dropped their forecast by about 3 million metric ton, which, you know, for USDA is actually a pretty large reduction. Um, Brazilian corn, again, about a 3 million bushel, uh, 3 million metric ton uh, production drop, and surprisingly, a 5 million metric ton drop in Brazilian soybeans. So the, the reduction from USDA standpoint, a little bit heavier cutback on the soybeans than the corn, but there's a lot of private forecasters that are actually looking at much, much lower numbers than what USDA is forecasting. So the next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit about the weather conditions right now. And I want to highlight last year, we had a record soybean crop in the United States. We, so we had the largest soybean crop we've ever produced in bushel count. We've had the second largest corn crop we've ever produced in the United States. And one of the reasons is because we had the Eastern Corn Belt, the, I, the Illinois, the Indiana, Ohio, Kentucky, Missouri, even parts of Kansas and Nebraska had a very, very good year, even though we had some very dry conditions here in the northern and central plains. A very similar thing is happening right now in Brazil. So notice the production regions. We have that northern production region, primarily Mato Grosso, the tip, and then Goyos. Those are the two kind of northern states. Um, they produce about 35% of the soybeans in, the, in, in Brazil. And if you look in the very, very bottom, you've got Paraná and you've got Rio Grande do Sul. Those two, uh, those two states account for about another 30%. And what we're seeing is a very, very uh, big difference between the crop condition ratings in the north versus the crop condition ratings in the south. Northern, northern portions in Mato Grosso, they have already started harvest. So this, the new crop soybeans are already hitting the marketplace. Now, the, the, the harvest progress has been okay, but again, you start with some of those very northern regions. We really haven't gotten into that heavy soybean regions of Mato Grosso quite yet, but they're coming very soon. When we get into the southern part, they're a little bit further behind and they're getting into some key reproductive stages. I don't know exactly where they're at based on, you know, can planting date, but the southern regions are, are seeing some really, really important key reproductive stages. So remember this map as we start going forward. The next slide, please, is for corn. And I want to focus on the slide on the left hand side. So when we talk about corn in Brazil, there's actually two corn crops. The one on the left-hand side called the first season corn is where we're at today. The second season corn or often referred to as the safrina crop won't be planted until the soybean harvest is complete. 
So we're really focused on the left-hand side this first season. Notice that most of the corn for this first season, which accounts for about 25% of the total production, is in the south. It's in those southern growing regions. Next slide, please. This is an, an estimate, and again, this is uh, from USDA Crop Explorer. So these are NDVI. This would be vegetative indexes. And this is a departure from average. So if it's green, it's above average. If it's that brownish or gold or red, it would be below average. So we're, this is using satellite imagery, trying to say how green or healthy, an estimate of the healthiness of the crop. If you notice now, if you, if you look at the northern regions in Mato Grosso, again, some of the reason that this is a little bit blank is because they've started harvest already. These satellite images were taken from January 1 through January 8. So we're looking at a kind of a range of, of, of time period here. Notice the northern region, it looks like it's above average. So the crop health is above average, but if you get into the southern regions, it's well below average. So Brazil is facing a very similar situation that we were we did in the United States. There's areas that are in deep trouble and there's areas that are going to have a fantastic crop. So the challenge we have is saying what is going to the average going to be across the region, especially for soybeans. If we're talking first crop corn, that red area is really the heart of that first crop corn air region. Okay, so the corn market is also responding to some of this information about weather, temperature, and rainfall in both Brazil and Argentina. Next slide, please. This is Argentina. This is, uh, again, a map of where do they grow soybeans in Argentina. Cordoba is the big soybean producing state as well as the big corn producing state. But notice they have a, an area there kind of in the middle of the country that's really the heart of their corn and soybeans. Um, now, the development of the soybean crop in Argentina is very similar from a timing standpoint to what, what we're seeing in southern Brazil. So they're, they're in the vegetative stage, probably nearing that flowering stage. Next slide, please. This is a, ma uh, a map in trying to show where is corn produced in Argentina. And again, just like, uh, like in Iowa or in Illinois, the corn and the soybean crop are planted and harvested at about the same time. So their, their develop, crop development is also at about the same stage. Again, once again, notice Cordoba being that state that has the, the heaviest production levels. We're counting bushels or metric ton here. Next slide, please. This is the vegetative index, vegetative health index and for um, Argentina, again, for that same time period from January 1 through January 8th. Once again, the darker the red or the maroons, the worse off it is, it's below average. The greens mean it's, it's above average. Now, one of the things that, that has happened, especially in Southern Brazil, as well as Argentina, is that they have had very, very dry conditions and exceptionally hot conditions for the last about week to 10 days. So um, yesterday, uh, there, there were temperatures record of a, recorded at 113 degrees Fahrenheit in some of the central growing regions in Argentina, and it's very dry. One of the reasons we're seeing some, some reduction in the prices today is that there are forecasts for some additional rains and a little bit cooler temperatures hitting both Argentina as well as Southern Brazil going into next week. So the moral of the story is the, the Brazilian corn and soybean crop as well as the, in, in the South, as well as the Argentine corn and soybean crop in the South are looking at some really critical development stages. So the weather's being watched very closely and we're starting to see some more market volatility because of the weather conditions and the weather forecasts. So uh, hopefully I, if I remember right, that's my last slide. Uh, I'll turn things over to Tim Petrie and he'll give an update on the livestock sector. Good afternoon, everybody. Tim Petrie, Extension Livestock marketing economist, if we go to my first slide, I'm going to show you what the cattle prices are doing. And, you know, we started last month when I talked to you, the market started heating up and uh, particularly on the feeder cattle side, we've uh, continued that uh, really, really strong market and now have the best prices we've had since 2015. Uh, and it couldn't be more timely because uh, usually these first three weeks to the end of January are our biggest marketing weeks. Uh, you know, we think of the end of October, November being big, and that's when the calf market starts. 
and then nationwide, that's kind of the case. But North Dakota, our biggest uh, weeks are uh, right now, and that's going to happen this week, I'm sure. And the weather is moderating, a lot of calves coming in. Uh, KISS had over uh, se about 7,300 yesterday, and you know, and Napoleon and Stockman's are going on today, and they got big sales going on too. So we're going to sell a lot of calves. and. And, uh, you know, the, the prices when, kind of when we look at the charts, we'll see. But, you know, since the middle of October, uh, right now, 800 pound steers are selling for the same price as 550 steers were back in October. So calves that were held was a was a really good uh, idea there. So let's move along here. Let's talk about slaughter steers to begin with. Just if you go, can you go back, Dave? Yeah. He, just talk slaughter steers. I know not a lot of cattle fed to slaughter weight in North Dakota, but two biggest things that affect feeder cattle are slaughter steer prices, particularly the distant futures when whatever weight calves are being sold now, whenever they will reach uh, market weight. And then the other thing is corn that Frayne just got through talking about. So uh, I'll spend a little bit more time on this, giving you the key at the bottom because the rest of the charts are all color coded the same. Uh, the red line is usually, I, I, I that I use is usually the current price. So the red line is 2022 and then the light blue line 21, purple 2020 and the green line 2019. I like to throw the last three years on just because if it happened in the last three years, it could happen again. But anyway, uh, you see, you know, oh, the last couple of years, we really under underperformed on the cattle market 2020, of course, COVID and, and completely out of whack there and didn't follow seasonal patterns and $95 fed cattle at purple line back there. And so uh, go to last year then. Uh, we started off at relatively low levels there on the left hand side, the light blue line, 110 cattle, fed cattle, and we just continually improved uh, throughout the year. Uh, we did stall off in the summer there at about 125, but usually we go down in the, in the summer there. And so we just maintained, uh, you know, fundamentals were improving, strong export demand, strong domestic demand. We were starting to get the backlog of fed cattle that had built up through the pandemic uh, finished. And, and so uh, we marched on there and then in October then, we uh, finally really started getting things straightened around and, and brought cattle up from 125 up to 140 fed cattle and go to back to the left hand side then we're starting off there about 140 so our expectations for this year are for uh, quite a bit better cattle prices than than uh, we had last year. Again, last year at this time, we're at 110 and now we're on 40. So $30 better to start off the year. The red bars there, the red squares there are the futures market, you know, uh, starting there with February up into April over 140. And, you know, we're going to average, uh, according to the futures, at least 140 on cattle this year. And so that's what's helping to spark the feeder cattle market is that you know feedlots can can hedge 140 dollar fed cattle and, and and that helps out on the feeder cattle and then you know we've reduced the cow herd for three straight years we'll get our final beginning of 2020 numbers here at the end of the month january 31st is the annual cattle inventory report out from nas so next month i'll be report on that we know there's going to be fewer cattle fewer beef cows and so we'll uh, you know have a lower calf crop next year so that's all funneling into higher prices we see there on the top of the chart there the orange squares uh, then are the 2023 futures again up another five dollars or more from uh, this year and I think the way it looks now we can just keep going up uh, into into 2024 and 2025 20 if we continue our 10-year cycle our 
our highs have been in 2005, 2015 would be a cyclical price high. And so that if we continue in the weather and a lot of other things that 2025 will be our next cyclical high. So looks like a, you know, a couple more good years ahead of us barring uh, catastrophes. So go to the next slide, then we'll just hit the feeder cattle market classes. Here are 550 to six weight calves. Same color code there, and you know, uh, the purple and blue lines. Let's go to the right hand side of the chart there. October, in the middle of October, that middle week, October 15th, is always a tough time to sell uh, calves. It was the same way in, in uh, 19 and 20 and 20 and 21. We were, we were higher this last year, but uh, you know, that's been the low for the year. A lot of reasons for that. One is the calves just tend to come right off pasture, are not weaned and not bunk trained and so on. And the winter wheat crop hasn't grown enough yet to put calves on winter wheat down in the south. Also, the farmer feeders are combining corn, the Iowa, southern Minnesota, uh, and in the in Nebraska are still combining corn. And so when those things start to develop, winter wheat, and then the corn gets combined and, and, the, and the calves tend to be weaned, that it tends to spark the price and really, really did uh, this year, you can see. And so again, we're starting off there right up there close to uh, 190 on 560, 550 to six weight calves compared to 165 last year. But but uh, anyway, a nice improvement. So we're expecting again, like fed cattle and looking at the fed cattle futures and what can be hedged, we're looking for a much better year again uh, throughout most of the year. Uh, and, uh, and, and the same thing for the next year. So better calf prices ahead again, barring some emergency and uh, move on then to the heavier weight feeder cattle, the uh, 800 pounders, kind of the same story there, like the other two, like fed cattle and calves. Mid-year, we climbed above the last couple of years. And then since uh, October have seen a nice spark in prices again. Uh, last week, we uh, averaged 167 on these eight weight steers. And again, in the, in the previous slide we showed you in, in October, 550 calves were one average 165 and now the 800 pounders are or the, the that are being sold now were 550s back in october they're bringing the even a little bit better prices so uh, it was a, a good year to hang on to calves i realize a number of a lot of people couldn't do it because we're short of feed and and uh, had to keep the cat cows around and that was a very good idea because uh you know we need the cows to have calves to take advantage of it there is a futures market obviously for feeder cattle and uh you know our uh, corn is down 12 cents today and most feeder cattle contracts are up uh a dollar 20 and so we're back to that change corn 10 cents change feeder cattle uh you know a buck in the opposite direction and so the futures again are kind of following the fed cattle are singular signaling better prices throughout the year up by the uh end of the year uh this 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 fall up there at about 182 so uh signaling a much better year there again we're going to have fewer to sell our calf crop is going to be lower this fall than it was the last fall and in the, the fall before and, and uh, so as you know as long as demand holds there we're going to have fewer and fewer so i think better times ahead so go to the next slide uh kind of uh, just talk about here's last week's market report and uh, just kind of concentrate there on the on the middle there under steers under where that purple circle is but you know i when i show you that about that 189 average last week and they're going to average higher this week the average on 550 to six weight at kists uh, yesterday was just right shy of 195. So I think we'll bring them. You know, we've got a lot of cattle selling this week, and and the and the prices even be better. But you know that that 189 there. But but again, we you know there's that wide range in prices that always occurs. There were 
selling quite a few calves, 556 weight calves over $200 now and up to those fancy ones up to 208, but you know, some down to 176, just watching a sale for a little while this morning. It's at the non weaned uh, calves and, and, uh, and, you know, and, and sh no, no shots and things like that down at the bottom uh, side there. So again, when I show you the charts, it's an average, but there are certainly calves selling higher than that and calves selling lower than that. So go to the next slide. Uh, probably the easiest market class of cattle to predict, particularly in the fall, are cow prices. And again, here's the last three years and kind of interesting. We go right back there till the end of September. Uh, the last three years, they were just identical back there at $60. And I, I realize this is the lower. My, my chart here is for those 85 to 90 percent really, really lean cows that would be typical of a broken mouth cow that had a calf on her all uh, year. And and, uh, you know, not, may or may not be open, but anyway, I, I, it's just like calves. You see on the market report on the upper right-hand corner there, there are producers tell me, I sell my cows for a lot more than whatever they even selling now, $57. That's right, because of the, again, uh, of the quality. So mine tends to be the lower end of the cows here, but you see 60 bucks there in the first end of September, first of October. And by the middle of October, they've fallen off 10 bucks. And it happened the last three years and it probably happened again this year, but I think we'll be a little a uh, higher level than we've been the last couple of years. Uh, beef cow slaughter was up 10% uh, this year and won't be as high this year, I think, unless a major, major drought sits in, particularly down in, in the Southern Plains and unfortunately is getting a little dry there. So again, we're starting off now with cows above where they were the last three years up there. And I think we can do better on cow prices as long as uh, a major drought doesn't set in. So uh, go to the next slide then. We'll just finish up here with lambs and kind of the same thing on lambs as cattle. And, and I don't have a hog chart, but the kind of the same thing there is we're seeing much much improved uh, lamb prices there there's bowman sold lambs up in the top right hand corner you know those lighter weight uh 60 pound lambs up there over uh three hundred dollars and so much much improved from last year and then the slaughter lambs on the bottom as well last year again the pandemic really hurt lambs and a lot of lambs sold it at uh white tablecloth restaurants that that were closed and so on so uh, lambs just sold a load of lambs out of tapping uh, a week ago and you know up there at 231 dollars so uh look for a good lamb market again this year where the the u.s or even though we're holding an even increasing numbers in north dakota and the northern plain states the mountain states are still kind of struggling and so uh, uh we'll have fewer lambs and really really strong demand ethnic demand and so on so i think another good year so with that uh turn it over to uh dave and and uh, hear about uh bioproducts great thanks tim uh dave ripplinger bioproducts bioenergy economic specialist uh going to talk about a few things today starting with corn ethanol um, Frank did mention earlier that USDA did up their, their estimated use of corn for ethanol for this marketing year just a bit, but uh, very strong demand continues, uh, supporting uh, profitability across the industry, even with uh, $6 corn. So we're expecting that to continue for, for some time, which is, which is good news. Uh, on the bad side or the tough side uh, are two pieces of news that just came out uh, in the last week. Uh, the first was that the Supreme Court rejected uh, year-round E15 sales. Uh, so the previous administration uh, changed the rules that would allow E15. Uh, there was a long-standing uh, concern about reed vapor pressure and the ability to sell E15 as it didn't quite align. Uh, previous administration said it, al it aligned with the spirit of the rule. Uh, there was a lawsuit. Uh, appeal and then the final appeal to the Supreme Court. So the Supreme Court has rejected year-round E15 sales. Uh, the, the original decision came out last summer with uh, the, the actual uh, 
enactment or the actual use of the rule not coming until later, so the Supreme Court not following soon, uh, we're going to see those E15 sales uh, or the you know that availability in the marketplace uh, decline pr pretty quickly. Uh, you know, unfortunate is, is the industry is looking for new larger markets for product, and E15 was very promising, uh, especially in the last year or so. It was E15 on a, on a fuel basis? Uh, in many, many markets, it was lower cost than gasoline. Again, in the United States, most of our ethanol is used as a fuel additive uh, for octane as opposed to fuel for energy. But again, with, with the price, the relative prices of gasoline and ethanol, E15 in a lot of markets did work uh, for both consumers and the retailer. Uh, the other piece of uh, news that just came out, uh, which is also not positive, is the administration considering reducing the, the 2022 uh, renewable fuel mandate. So each year, the administration is supposed to come up with numbers for the, the, the next year regarding how much, how much uh, needs to be blended uh, or used uh, in the United States with different categories. Uh, in December, the administration came out with its, its numbers for 2022, as well as revised numbers for 20 and 21. Uh, they, they, they said in December that they were going to be looking at or proposed a 15 billion gallons, which is what's in mandate and what everybody expected. And when I say mandate, what was in the original law? Uh, now it looks like the administration's under considerable pressure and opened the idea of reducing that number somewhat. And again, that would be unfortunate because it would remove that, that underlying support in terms of use. Uh, at the same time, you know, demand is relatively strong. So just looking at uh, where we're at for production had the last two years and then just a dot for this year, uh, as you can see, we're, we're, we're about where we've been uh, in terms of production, really looking forward to a, a strong uh, amount of use. Uh, we'll see if, if the economy starts to get a little bit shaky later on in the year. Uh, but right now we've seen pretty, you know, almost a complete recovery in, in the, the transportation fuel market. The, the gasoline market uh, and ethanol moving along with that. Uh, you know, we're not at, we're not at record levels of production by any stretch, uh, but again, quite profitable for those who are who are uh, operating. Uh, just looking a little bit at stocks again, we're kind of in that same spot where we have been uh, looking forward, not you know, looking hopefully to see a little bit more stable uh, numbers here in 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 2022. We had a lot of fluctuation. Obviously, we had. Uh, a buildup with COVID, uh, a drawdown last year, and actually pretty tight supplies for much of the year continuing on. Uh, you know, even to today, where you know we're at the lower end of where we typically want to be again, which supports those higher prices. We'll see exactly how how things pan out. Again, there's there's been pretty steady demand for for gasoline, which has been pulling that ethanol through the system, uh, but not allowing that accumulation of stocks, which might lead to some downward pressure pressure on prices. Uh, this is a slide that presents the the, the blend of ethanol and gasoline. Uh, and one of the reasons to bring this up is one of the arguments used uh, for reducing the uh, the renewable fuel mandate or that that volume uh, for 2022 is that you can't blend more. And of course, without E15, uh, that's true to some extent. But of course, we have E85. The other thing to bring up in this too is it's basically just a bunch of noise. We see a lot of variation. Uh, from from week to week, but it's also aligned with statistics chart. Where if I if I back this up to have zero at the uh, on on the vertical axis, this these, this variation would look a whole lot smaller. Again, we see that variation from week to week. You know, typically just under ten percent, and we're going to expect that to to continue uh, moving forward. Uh, another side note too is actually E eighty five use in California continues to grow at a pretty steady clip. It's a small number, but continues to grow. And it's actually a, a pretty good market uh, that exists. Uh, last piece of news uh, or, or uh, information about the market that's going on, there's actually a third carbon pipeline announced earlier this week. So again, we had our first announcement uh, last year from Summit Carbon Solutions, uh, which is looking to build a pipeline from Iowa to North Dakota, uh, taking CO2 that's produced during fermentation at ethanol refineries, uh, transporting it, uh, in that case, to, to North Dakota, to Western North Dakota, to permanently sequester in the ground. Uh, two more projects, and again, the one just this last week, the, the other one that came up in 2021 was Navigator CO2 Ventures, which is a very long pipeline to go into Illinois, to formations there. And then finally, the one that was just announced is Wolf Carbon Solutions, but they have a pretty strong uh, relationship with ADM. 
uh, the, the, the pipeline would be owned and operated by Wolf uh, and go 350 miles to, to Illinois and actually make use of uh, some geology that ADM already controls and has been using for CO2 capture. So uh, again, you see this huge movement and this is uh, something I think we should all take as evidence of the, the, the bigger implications for carbon. Uh, including outside of the carbon offset markets, which typically have gotten a lot of news as those are, you know, uh, contracts that are being presented direct to, to farmers. In this case, it's uh, an opportunity presented to ethanol refiners, but increasing that demand pull uh, for low carbon fuels, uh, for corn ethanol, and then ultimately for corn. So those were uh, the, the, the presentations that we had. Uh, we're going to change it up just a little bit this year, and we actually have a, a bit of time uh, to do this. Uh, to help spur discussion and, and maybe um, some cajoling and the like, I would thought we'd ask uh, the panelists what they, they might be looking for in 2022 in terms of, of news or events or concerns. Uh, and since, Frank, you turned your camera on first, <laughs> I'll, I'll give you the floor, as dangerous as that is. <laughs> All right. I, I, I promise I will make this brief. Um, so, so actually, I've been thinking about this quite a bit. And one of the things that has been driving our grain markets for the last several years, at, you know, once we've got the, the U.S.-China trade war um, at least put on hold, it has been this very strong rebound in export sales. And the two driving forces behind that have been China, number one, and actually a strong, very strong demand from Mexico. And so as I look forward, um, we spend a lot of time talking about production. That's obviously something on everybody's mind. We continue to argue about that, and, and that will be front and center news. But I also want to look at the demand base, because even though we're having uh, the largest soybean crop on record and the second largest corn crop on record, we still have this very strong underlying demand base that's helping to support prices. So if we start to see some of that underlying demand base, in particular, the growth in that demand base start to slow, which is why I'm a bit concerned about, um, uh, about China, that the growth rate of the Chinese livestock sector is starting to slow, um, that could potentially have some implications longer term. Thanks, Brian. Brian, do you have any thoughts, anything you're looking at this year? Well, still keeping an eye on, uh, uh, obviously, uh, production costs being a big issue and not just fertilizer that's in uh, the equipment market, used equipment's up, you know, a tremendous amount. Big reason for that is with uh, new equipment, you know, there's uh, areas where there are a lot of pieces of new equipment sitting on lots uh, that don't run because they don't have the uh, the final parts that they need to actually be operable, which then drives up used equipment costs because, you know, in theory, you can have used equipment right now uh, it, and, 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 and it runs. But at the same time, folks aren't trading off their old equipment for new equipment because they need the old equipment because they can't get their new equipment because they're on the wait list. <laughs> So that's a mouthful. <laughs> and I, hopefully I didn't confuse myself or anyone else with the, with that statement, but that's, that, and then finally, and I didn't bring it up is uh, the, the issues that are uh, possibly going to be there with regard to herbicides and pesticides that may be used, the ability to manufacture those products, given the limited supply of some of the chemicals like yellow phosphorus that goes into making things like glyphosate as well as uh, Liberty and, and others. And what are the alternatives for weed, things like weed control? If in fact there is a limited supply or prices are prohibitively high or something on some of these, uh, some of these chemicals that, that we need. So that's another thing that uh, hopefully won't be a big issue, but it's one that I'm definitely tracking and, and uh, hopefully don't have to do a, 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 I don't know, a, a sad report on in the next two or three months. It's Ryan. Tim, how about you? Yeah, okay. Well, uh, on the cattle and, and sheep side particular, my, my biggest concern obviously is the drought that we had and the pasture conditions and that we're going to need rain now. Thankfully, particularly in southeastern North Dakota up to central North Dakota, we've had rain and the drought monitor looks a lot better, uh, but not so much in 
particularly in the Northwest. And so we have no control over the weather, but on the other hand, we need to make plans. And so as we get uh, closer, I, you know, snow coming across today and so on. So all the moisture helps, but that's a major concern. And we're going to have to make decisions earlier this year if the drought, uh, you know, looks like it's kind of holding around. So that's a big concern for, for me on the livestock sector. And then just following up on, on a frame in China and so on, uh, you know, China's has been our third best uh, customer for beef and just uh, skyrocketing in amounts there. And that's really helped out the, the Fed uh, cattle market. But, uh, uh, you, you know, the, there's uh, can be issues there. One of the things that helped us out is that that uh, Brazil had two atypical BSE cases. So China cut them off for about three months or taking beef back from them again. Now uh, Canada just got a, a case, an atypical case. And so China, uh, uh, Japan and uh, cut off uh, Canada. And, and with these atypical cases, it's kind of a temporary deal, but it can uh, affect prices in the short run. So just because the prices look uh, very good into the next couple of years that some of these short run things can come along to cause the market to go down. So uh, certainly be aware of that. And on the shorter term, things like backgrounding or something, um, you know, looking at some price risk management in your marketing plan may be warranted. So uh, I'll quit there. Yeah, and then I'll, I'll finish up. And if there's any uh, conversation you guys want to have about the points uh, either made during during your presentations or during this this discussion, be great. Uh, I'm, I'm looking to hear uh, what discussion happens as the farm bill comes up. Uh, you know, it's going you know, to start hearing murmurs about that and some specifics. And I'm, I'm specifically interested in, in what they might be saying about carbon and climate. Uh, there's a possibility, uh, if not a likelihood, that the, the, the next farm bill is going to formally engage with those topics and exactly what that might mean in terms of possible programs, which could be additional uh, funds, maybe an incentive uh, for, for farmers to adopt certain practices, kind of like we saw last year with the, the cover crop payment that was kind of thrown in in March, uh, you know, exactly how that might take place or will there be regulation or education or who knows what. Again, not, not much has been said, but you got 12 months to look forward to, to those types of conversations. And yeah, we'll okay. Uh, Frayne, maybe you can follow up on this, but there was a chat wondering where the budgets are for 2022, and Ron Haugen isn't on. He's doing the budgets, and, you know, I think one of the struggles this year is uh, on the production costs, what are they going to be, and then maybe even on prices. So I think, they're, you know, they're, they will have budgets, but they're held up a little bit. I don't know, Frayne, if you know any more than that or not. Yeah, I've been, in fact, I've been emailing back and forth with Ron, and I know he's he's literally, he is working on them right as we speak um, and I'm I'm in the process of updating some of my price forecast to get them included so hopefully they will be out very very shortly. Tim you got a question about hogs. <coughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> How are the hog markets doing? Okay uh, yeah they kind of fell off seasonally like they always do in the fall and, <coughs> and now with the higher corn prices they uh, got down to break even levels and and so there was a struggle there but you know the looking at the futures market I didn't have my chart here but uh, the futures uh, for 2022 are falling a normal seasonal pattern back up to a hundred dollars for this summer and uh, and even though corn prices are six dollars that's well above the cost of production so I think it'll be another good year for for the hog market uh, just get through got through the seasonal pattern here in November and we'll see higher prices in fact they have started to, to spark here as well Great. And then probably a question for you, Brian, will there be enough fertilizer to go around in the spring? Um, I think that there's probably going to be some um, regional or local shortages. Uh, I think that that's probably likely. And there's a, there's a pretty big reason for that. And that is a lot of the folks that I have spoken with who buy and sell fertilizer are very concerned about being stuck holding the bag on high price fertilizer if prices fall and they don't have it all sold 
because right now at the prices we're talking about that they're that they're having to pay and then turn around and pass on if you know if fertilizer is at let's just say a thousand dollars a ton and it falls 10 percent, and they're left holding thousands and thousands of tons at 10 percent well that's after a 10 percent drop that's a that's a hundred dollars a ton that they lose and so if we're talking about 5,000, 10,000, 20,000, 100,000 tons that they're sitting on that they haven't yet priced and sold yet, nominally that turns into a lot of dollars. Now, if it's $400 a ton and it's down 10%, that's you know roughly 40 bucks, right? So $40 a ton lost. So as a percentage, it's the same, but we're dealing with such big numbers because of the cost of what it costs per ton that a drop of five, seven, ten percent on fertilizer and doesn't even have to be that big could really financially hurt a, a, a co-op or, or a, a chemical distributor of some kind. And they're really concerned about that. And as a result, they're probably not going to run the risk of having a big, big supply sitting on hand. That's that's a lot to say that they're they're not going to order much more than they have priced or that they already have commitments to buy. And as a result, that could wind up with some some local shortages if folks are coming back later on and requesting more than they actually, uh, you know, typically used or priced in the first place. I think that that the risk of that is probably pretty high and and it all stems from uh, folks worried about who are who are making these decisions, buying and selling, being left holding the bag if and when prices finally drop. If Frame wants to add something to that or Dave, that's fine, but that's. That's that's the big concern among our, our retailers. No, I, I would agree with what Brian just said. Uh, a question for me about the renewable diesel market and demands. Uh, it remains hot. It's a big deal. Um, the, the price of carbon in California has has gone down a little bit or the market's somewhat weakening. A lot more volatility in those prices, but still more than high enough uh, to uh, have a, a serious demand pull on renewable diesel and vegetable oil, which we're seeing throughout you know, the whole veggie oil complex. And again, that feeds back to uh, the canola announcement uh, you know, that, that was made. Uh, EPA uh, noted that they submitted the, the canola renewable diesel pathway uh, to, to OMB, which is basically that last step. It does have to go in the register for a little bit and, and have comments, but that's a really big deal. Uh, the, the demand for renewable diesel has impacted all vegetable oil prices, but canola has not been an, an approved feedstock at the federal level. And so once that get a, gets approved, there will be that, that new market for feedstock, uh, which still will not be enough. And so we'll see exactly how that plays out in coming months and years, but the market remains quite strong. Uh, and uh, we'll, as a whole, and, and we'll, we, we have a lot more to, to, to realize over the next uh, year or so. I think this next one's for Frain. Yep. So uh, some of the other oil seed crops, so they tend to follow soybean prices. And yes, there is some some correlation. Um, if you look back historically, if we have uh, uh, good supplies, lots of oil crops that are available, um, the soybean market tends to have a huge impact on canola as well as on sunflower. This year is the exception. Um, are the canola stocks both in the U.S. as well as in Canada are exceptionally tight. And so right now, um, even though there is this connection, this correlation or relationship, canola prices right now are well above kind of the typical ratio, that relationship. Um, and I do expect canola to have much more of a independent life from what's going on in soybeans. Now, obviously, if soybean takes a really big hit, if we start to see soybean prices drop dramatically, that will start pulling some of the canola prices down. But this, the supply demand conditions, in particular on canola, are so exceptionally tight right now that it, it is kind of getting a life of its own. And that then is also Im impacting sunflower prices because canola and sunflowers tend to be a closer substitute uh, from an oilseed standpoint than, let's say, canola canola sunflower and soybean oil. There are some little dif there are some differences in this characteristics, but not only for frying, but also for cooking. So this year in particular, we're starting to see more of a separation. Canola seems to have more of a life of its own. Uh, what does the pulse crop outlook look like? Uh, it depends upon the pulse specific, specifically, uh, but right now, and, and again, I want to separate old crop pricing from new crop pricing. 
Old crop supplies are exceptionally tight. New crop supplies, the market, the processors or those, those handlers, bean handlers and final end users are working very hard to try and incentivize additional acreage to try and not only refill what we have, but also refill some of the supply chain. So what does the outlook look like? Um, a lot will depend. I do think we're going to have an increase in acres. Obviously, everything will depend upon yield. My concern with the pulse crops, like a lot of these other small market crops, is that they tend to have what's called an inelastic demand. So the demand base is, has, is a kind of a bandwidth. And as long as we stay in that bandwidth, everything seems to work okay. But if we get a year or a couple of years, we have very, very large supplies prices tend to fall very rapidly because we don't have a lot of alternative uses. There aren't a lot of other people that are looking for that kind of product. On the flip side, like what we're seeing right now, if we have a very tight supply, if we don't have a lot of available, prices tend to skyrocket. I mean, they, they go up very, very high, and it's basically a race of, amongst the people that need it the worst. Okay, so what, what I'm a little concerned about is we're at the very high level right now. So if we start to get increased acreage, planted acreage, and we have a very good yield, we can go from a very, very tight supplies to very, very excessive supplies really fast. So we could see potentially a big swing lower in, in, in spot market prices by harvest, depending upon what happens. So there is an incentive to plant them. I would not be worried about planting them other than to try and get as many con any, as much production contract as you feel comfortable. Because if we do have a big crop, we're going to have much lower prices by harvest. Any hope of a rebound in the next couple of months for the wheat market? Um, there is a possibility. Um, in, and right now, kind of what's pulling spring wheat down is really the winter wheat markets. Uh, Argentina is going to have actually a very good winter wheat crop. Australia had a very good winter wheat crop. Um, so the winter wheat supplies, both domestically and globally, are very comfortable, which again is now pulling down some of the, the, the spring wheat. Is it possible to go higher? Yes, it, I do think it is. Uh, in particular for, old, for new crop wheat. So right now we have quite a price spread between old crop spring wheat and new crop spring wheat. I do think we'll start to see some stronger uh, new crop spring wheat prices as we get closer to planting time. Because it, in my opinion, right now, given the price relationships, uh, new crop spring wheat isn't quite strong enough, I think, to hold the kind of acres that they really need to hold. Um, there are some things happening globally now, obviously, with the, with the tensions going between Ukraine and Russia that we need to be watching from a political standpoint. That would obviously be a game changer. To be very honest, I hope that they resolve their problems and we don't get into any kind of major conflict because that would cause disruption throughout our entire system. Uh, grain markets, uh, spring wheat uh, have they been falling rapidly. Do I start my panic selling now <laughs> or write this out? Assume about 70% sold on both old, uh, old crops. Okay. Um, <laughs> that's a really good question. <laughs> no, I, I, I would be a little cautious right now. What, one of the other things that's happening is we are seeing, given the information I just went through on corn, the other thing that's helping kind of helping pull some of the, the wheat complex down is that we're seeing a softening in corn prices. And, and so there is this connection between um, corn and, and wheat. When, when corn prices are very low, wheat does its own thing. But when corn prices are very high, we have to keep your premium for wheat above corn in order to prevent it from being used as a livestock feed. And we're starting to see those corn prices soften a bit because of some of the information coming out of USDA. I do think we'll see a little bit more of a rebound in corn prices in particular because of what's happening in South America right now. So my right now, my sense is I think you'll have one more shot at it. Probably won't get quite to the levels that we saw uh, before Christmas. But I do think you have one more shot. Guys, just don't miss it. Well, best time for new crop uh, wheat sales. Um, I, I, I'll be honest. I would wait until close to that, that March 31 planting intentions report. I, I think that it will be that March intentions report either just before or just after that the markets are going to work, have to work very, very hard to make sure they maintain spring wheat acres. Great. And I think we've answered all the questions, uh, given that we're a little bit over, uh, might as well wrap her up. I want to thank, uh, the, the 
panelists for presenting uh, and for everybody for joining us today. We will be back in a month, uh, again, right after the next WASD report. Uh, we'll be uh, here for our webinar on Thursday, February 10th, uh, at the same time, one o'clock central. Uh, if you would like to see the, the slides or recording of this or and the most recent uh, webinars, you can check it out at the website online. Uh, other than that, I hope that you all have a great day and that it doesn't snow too much in the next day or so. Bye. Yeah, get your snowblower serviced and gassed up. <laughs>